Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Confabulating. We're delighted to be joined live from Ethiopia by Dr. Alexander Meckelberg of UCL, who will be speaking to us tonight on the subject of the abolition and legacy of slavery in Ethiopia. Dr. Meckelberg is a research fellow at UCL, affiliated with the ERC-funded projects African Abolitionism, Abolitionism, the Rise and Transformations of Anti-Slavery in Africa focusing on the history and slavery and the abolition in Ethiopia. Prior to that, Dr. Meckelberg was a research fellow at the Hjörb Ludolf Center for Ethiopian and Eritrean Studies at the University of Hamburg, an editorial assistant with the Encyclopedia Ethiopica from 2010 to 2016. After that, he became a visiting scholar at the Catholic University of East Africa in Nairobi, affiliated with the ERC-funded project uh, focused on slavery in Africa, a dialogue between Europe and Africa, and in 2019, he became a hot dog fellow at the Fritz Thiessen Foundation at the University of Effort. From 2020, he has become an editorial board member of Ethiopia International, the Journal for Ethiopian and Eritrean Studies. His research interests include the social and political history of Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa, focusing on race, slavery, labor and migration, political culture, citizenship, and minority groups. And in 2017, he completed his PhD on the subject of history, identity, and minority citizenship, looking in particular at the case of the Mao and Kome peoples of Western Ethiopia. Dr. Meckelberg, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Not at all, thank okay. you. I believe you have a PowerPoint for us to begin our presentation tonight. That is true, yes. Let me, let me try and share the screen so that we can go ahead into my recent uh, field work that I'm doing. Is it visible already? Yeah, it is. Uh, yep, that's fine. Okay, although I've been on the last page. Let me see how that works now. Okay. I think this is uh, my first, I, I saw just now, we are, we are live on Facebook. This is, I've seen this. So and so is live on Facebook. Now this is the first time for me, so I'm pretty thrilled. <laughs> I'm exploring a, an old medium from a very new angle. So thank you very much for having me um, on this uh, fan fan fantastic uh, program. And uh, hello everyone from Ethiopia. I was introduced already, so I'm not going to go back on that. I want to share a couple of thoughts with the community tonight on um, studies or research that has been sort of uh, my interest in the last couple of uh, years, particularly since I've been doing my uh, PhD in Western Ethiopia, I have come to encounter the legacies of slavery and abolition in Ethiopia, a topic that is not really widely explored as we will see in the forthcoming uh, presentation. In the, in the next few minutes. Um, and I have been particularly lucky to actually been able to explore this uh, topic of slavery and abolition and the slave trade in the Ethiopian social fabric and so forth over the last couple of years since I was an ERC uh, member or member of an ERC project uh, called SLAFNET, Slavery uh, and the slave trade in Africa, a dialogue between Europe and, uh, and Africa that was a mobility grant that sort of enabled to set up a network of schools, universities and researchers that were looking at different uh, aspects of slavery in, in Africa. And I was sort of engaged with the Ethiopian part of this uh, project. And very recently I've joined UCL, um, again, being uh, very lucky to kind of uh, have the opportunity to become a research fellow at uh, UCL History Department um, with AFRAP, Transformations of Slavery and Anti-Slavery uh, in Africa, another ERC grant, uh, this time headed uh, by our PI uh, prime, uh, principal investigator, Professor Dr. Benedetta Rossi. So what I'm going to talk to about today is really sort of the synthesis of what's going on in slavery studies in the field of Ethiopian studies. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. So let me see how this works. A short outline of the presentation would be that I will try to 
sort of introduce everyone into uh, what slavery and the slave trade in Ethiopia meant in its historical perspective. I do believe that many people will uh, be not so familiar with the idea of African slavery as such, and particularly with the idea of Ethiopian slavery, as many people might have the image of Ethiopia as this non-colonial or anti-colonial state that has been uh, freed from uh, colonial uh, penetration, and especially is not part of the Western uh, African transatlantic slaving systems that we uh, know much more about. After that, I would uh, like to introduce uh, briefly the research history. So, you know, the, the legacies of uh, other trajectories on which we build when we try to uh, discuss and actually broaden the idea and the, and the research on slavery and the slave trade and human bondage and chattel slavery and so forth in Ethiopia in this particular case. And then of course, um, give a brief outline on what we are doing at the moment and what I think uh, are necessary steps for future scholarship. So very briefly, um, speaking about slavery in Ethiopia is both new as much as it is old. We'll come to that point later. A lot of the scholarship that we have on slavery in Ethiopia is basically uh, rooted in the 60s and 80s and then it kind of withers away to a certain degree. Very broadly, we know from um, the historian trader Cosmos Indicopleustis, for example, who wrote in the sixth century, sixth century, who was visiting the Red Sea trades and the Dulis and the port of Aksum and so forth, um, that there was barter trade in slaves and gold that came from far of the uh, hinterland of the Aksumite Empire. If you see the map, um, maybe around the areas where Sudan is indicated now, Sinar and so forth, areas, Fasubli, areas that were sort of slave reservoirs for the Aksumite Empire that we know about that have been reported um, throughout history. So this Aksumite hinterland, where also the name Baria, which is currently in present day uh, Amharic and Tigrinya and other Ethiosemitic languages uh, used uh, to designate slaves, Baria mean slave, or the Tselimbet, the house of the black or the lineage of the black people, indicating some kind of uh, colorism, some kind of you know uh, racial categories, if you want, that have already been in existence in this uh, early fourth century uh, kingdom of Aksum that of course had its wider expansion and trade networks across the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. Further into time and as, as centuries uh, pass, we understand from other sources that I will talk about a little bit later, that demand in the Ethiopian slaves was largely driven by maybe its uh, geographical position, the way it is situated in the Horn of Africa, connecting sort of the Arabian worlds, the, the Indian Ocean worlds, but also the Mediterranean and the Sudanese, uh, even probably the, the, the Saharan lands and, and areas. Um, and driven, of course, by um, the expansion of empires, Aksum, as I said, the empire of Aksum, the empire of uh, Meroe, the empire of Mercuria, and so forth, who are all sort of slaving economies, probably in its own regard. And all those through the centuries have created pressure on this uh, Ethiopian territory that has never been Ethiopia until the 20th century century basically. I mean, we're looking at a map without a border. Um, so the borders are very lightly indicated on this map um, to indicate that this is sort of a cultural area and not uh, the political uh, territory that we know today. So the Ottoman Empire, of course, that penetrates into the Sudan and into uh, the Red Sea areas, extracts slaves from these uh, areas of Ethiopia, Southern Ethiopia, Western Ethiopia, then the interest in uh, or the labor demand in, Ar in the Arabian Peninsula. Of course, the same is true for the Indian subcontinent and so forth. So it's largely domestic markets. It's uh, the need of domestic labor, um, but it's also prestige. Having a slave in many societies means a lot. It means to be, you know, 
bordering the wealthier part of the society, for example, as it does in Ethiopia. We'll talk about this later. So it's not a matter of the outside world only. It's really also a question of how Ethiopia itself is a slaving um, area or slave holding society, if you want, or consists of many slave holding societies. The majority uh, or the main trade routes that we know about, of course, the Nile Valley, connected as we see in the in the in the in the far west uh, through uh, Matama and Gadarif and so forth, Sinar, those connected Ethiopia or the Ethiopian region to the Nile Valley, the Nile route, so to speak. Then we have Red Sea ports, starting with Adulis, the first sort of known Aksumite port, but then Masawa and the whole Red Sea course, coast is spotted, dotted with the slave market. And of course, then further, further south, Zela, Barbara, and so forth are also markets connected to the hinterland of the Ethiopian area that then connect to the Indian Ocean areas. Um, talking about numbers, I mean, just to give you a very brief uh, indication of why does it matter or how important is it in world history of slavery? Um, it's relatively difficult to analyze because we don't have this statistics that the transatlantic uh, slave trade offers. But from uh, travel reports and then very late, I mean, now we've been talking about the sixth century, but it's really the 19th, mid 19th century where we have travel reports that indicate, that give us a good background on how slavery was organized and how the slave markets function. We have a, an a, approximation of eight to 10,000 uh, slaves annually in the mid 19th century. So uh, it's really difficult to kind of calibrate this back or forth you know, so this is kind of the, the number that um, I'm currently dealing with. Slavery in the Ethiopian uh, area, or ways into, slave, uh, into slavery, was uh, of course through, as we said, the state making processes. So depending on which period um, we look at, the Aksumite Empire made slaves, you know, they created hinterlands, but also the Ethiopian Empire itself was, um, a polity that created its own uh, subject uh, vessel states, so to speak, which were basically slave uh, states. Then, of course, we have the 16th century, the war, uh, the jihad of uh, Ahmed Ibrahim al Rasi against the Ethiopian Empire. Both we have the uh, we have the chronicles of those days, um, the Futur al Habesha on the one hand and the chronicles of the Ethiopian emperors on the other hand, and both basically speak on, you know, slave making, I mean, prisoner of, prisoners of war become slaves and so forth. But then as, as time goes by, um, there is also some knowledge that we have about debt bondage, bondage, feudal, the feudal system expands that we have in the Ethiopian highlands, in the Northern Ethiopian uh, areas that then comes down to uh, southern Ethiopia or what is today southern Ethiopia, if people, for example, were unable to pay their tributes, it is not rare that then they sell parts of the family or a member of the family into slavery or give it to the Lord they, they owe taxes to and that person then may sell uh, such a subject into, into slavery, such stories exist. Um, the trading system is both large scale. We have this in the 19th century, and I'll come to the sources a little bit later where we have this from. Uh, in the 19th century, we see this major slave markets that dot the region where we have uh, traders who kind of organize in a larger way the taxation system and you know pay people off and then create uh, larger, uh, higher amounts of uh, slave prices and sell people to the, you know, to the Indian Ocean or the Red Sea slave trade. But we have also this very, very petty slave uh, raiding system, like somebody is a shifter in the, in the Ethiopian context, a bandit, somebody, a robber, basically uh, finds uh, ambushes a family, steals a child and sells it to the next market. So both are relatively organized and 
large scale system as opposed to a small scale system where both families and individual raiders and traders were sort of integrated in this uh, system of, of trade. But as I said earlier, of course, they um, not only the Ethiopian Empire, the Ethiopian Empire that is sort of consisting of different small kingdoms, and all the small kingdoms themselves had their own, um, you know, background in uh, or sort of system, econ economy of, of slave trading. And as this empire, the Ethiopian Empire, builds and connects these different slaving societies, uh, the toll system becomes very important, like one. Uh, polity gives slaves to the next polity, pays tax to this polity, while the next polity, until the slaves finally end at uh, one of the exit points, you know, from this uh, Ethiopian area. Abolition, of course, is an important, as much as slavery is an important issue in the Ethiopian uh, history, the attempts to abolish slavery are extremely important in Ethiopian history. So the first decree that we know about uh, has been issued by uh, King Galaudius in the 16th century. And this is, a, this is interesting because it's a decree that forbids the trade in slaves through the Christian territory and especially targets Muslim traders and especially targets uh, the, 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 the source of demand that is this uh, the Sultanate of Adal that has just started waging uh, a jihad against the kingdom of uh, Ethiopia, the kingdom of Gonda or the, uh, yeah, exactly. So, and then through time, we don't know much about what happened between the, at, at this point at least, we don't know what happened between the 16th and the 19th century, but then again with the interest of the British um, in this part of the world, uh, treaties of friendship come to be made between uh, British uh, consulates and uh, consulars and 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 uh, uh, explorers who, when they meet Ethiopian kings, always have a treaty of friendship that has a clause on, uh, you know, the abolition of slavery. So. If, uh, Great Britain already being a motor of this uh, abolitionist idea uh, in its con colonial expansion, we have to say, is sort of targeting also Ethiopian ru uh, rural, uh, local rulers um, and sort of bringing this idea of abolition into the country. Some an aspect I will talk about a little bit later. So in 1884, for example, we have this uh, first uh, treaty that is obviously written between uh, the British Empire and Atze Johannes, King Johannes, in 1884. It's part of a peace treaty um, where uh, Johannes wants to or uh, adheres to. Uh, the suppression of slave trade again in his area. And this in his area or in the area we are talking about is extremely important because the, the Ethiopia that the British knew in 1884 is not the Ethiopia that we know today. It's Highland Ethiopia, it's a strip of land in the Ethiopian highlands where now we must always question how far was the influence of Johannes during this time? How much was he actually able to control during this time? And what happened in all these other areas where we at this point don't have the data? We are mere, sort of merely trying to uh, calibrate and project uh, you know, from travel reports and so forth what, what may have happened. Um, without going too much into detail, as I said, there is this large-scale expansion of the Ethiopian Empire towards the end of the 19th century. Under uh, uh, King Menelik, we have just celebrated the, uh, the Battle of Adwa victory, you know, where the Italians, Italian colonial aspirations were repelled. And this enabled Menelik to kind of expand the Ethiopian Empire uh, to the borders and the ex extension that we know of today. And in this particular um, time, there, there happened something that I have been uh, indicated, that I have been indicating earlier already, this connecting of different slave systems that then at some point for a very short while collide in Addis Abeba as the center, the new center of this empire. 
um, where slave labor is demanded, not only in the courts, but even to just make roads, you know, build houses and so forth. It's very, very uh, quick expansion and cent cent centralization of the empire demands labor. And much of that was done by uh, slaves. Few year, a few years after already, Haile Selassie begins in his uh, attempt to modernize the center uh, and the empire to abolish slavery. So the first major blow to slavery comes in 1920 already. And we speak about 1890 for the beginning of this empire making, making uh, 1806, this uh, Menelik uh, dies. Um, and 1820 is already succeeded by, well, after Legiasu and Saudito and so forth, but he's already uh, succeeded in, in 1920 in a completely new um, sort of morale and idea of modernization takes hold where slavery really sort of reduces um, in the idea of the modernization process. But the question that we still have is whether uh, at that point the empire the small states were actually on board with all these policies, you know, while the center may have this increasing and very rapid uh, change of systems in mind, it still consisted of several different smaller kingdoms and polities. And those kingdoms and polities, how were they on board? How did they react to these ideas of abolition over the years? This is one of the questions that I would like to uh, kind of follow in, you know, the, the years to come, <laughs> if I may say so. So the research history is, it's a bit, it's dotted through uh, since the 60s. Uh, late historian Richard Pankhurst, of course, has given us all the tools. He has gone through all the travel reports that we ever seen, uh, that, that ever were there. And he sort of digested everything and uh, dissected everything um, that that is there on slavery. But it's really, as uh, John McCarkey said recently, is really slavery has remained, although there was scholarship, um, a bit of a, yeah, there was slavery. Yes, there was the slave trade and it was important and sometimes it was contested, but that's it. There is no place of slavery studies in this sort of empire. Uh, narrative or historiography that we have, the grand narrative of Ethiopia as an uncolonized, uh, non-colonized state and so forth. Um, very few studies have taken up the local systems. We, most of them are really talking, you know, explorers coming to the, the Ethiopian kings and speaking about slavery and what has been done on slavery and how important is slavery. Very few studies are there about, for example, the minor, uh, smaller, uh, less organized, less hierarchically, less empire uh, groups that then also make the empire. It's not to sort of <laughs> uh, reduce their importance within the empire, but it's the, the local histories, Kaffa, Oromo, uh, Sheka, you know, all this uh, Gamu, Gofa, Jima, and so forth. Jima is an exception because it's been relatively well studied in terms of slavery. But there is, there is really few on the local systems of slavery though. Christian, Muslim, it's also about the uh, different sort of jurisdictions that are being applied. And then non-Christian and non-Muslim jurisdictions. So there are many small kingdoms that also practice slavery, but how did they organize themselves? How, how, was, organized, how was slavery organized within those uh, kingdoms and polities? As I already indicated, we can't go without the travel reports. They are hugely important, but they are much tainted by the political interest of the, of the time and of the explorer and of the country where the explorer came from. Um, the British are the most vocal, of course, in the early 19th century, early mid 19th century, uh, but they remain very important in their, in their uh, and they're always a little bit tainted. I have a, a, a Harris Convelis, his, uh, his book on um, the highlands of Ethiopia, where he visits the court of Salis Elassi, the grandfather of Menelik. He has this, uh, it's, a, it's a very thorough uh, study of, of slavery. It's enormous on how much this was important to him. Um, 
And at some point he says, Salih Selassie, um, his eyes, that's Salih Selassie's eyes have been opened to the fact that the, the whole of these wretched beings become converted to Mohammedanism. So it's really also in, in written in the spirit of the time, the British being very wary about the expansion of the Ottoman Empire and then sort of seeking alliance with the Ethiopian rulers who they deem Christians and think, okay, let us uh, go with these people, uh, let us nurture our contact and then we have a bulwark against them, the uh, Islamic or Muslim uh, slavery of the time. So this is a very important point that none of these uh, travel reports comes at face value. They're not anthropologists. They are really there to kind of uh, strike a deal, make a treaty, you know, and report back what is important for the motherland at that point. Um, it continues, of course, the anti-slavery uh, society becomes hugely important. Uh, they go as far as giving uh, Ethiopian rulers uh, airtime, we would say today airtime, it was like uh, uh, letter time. <laughs> so they publish um, letters of Ethiopian kings. Johannes uh, has a letter in the, in the anti-slavery report. Uh, Menelik has, an, has an, uh, a letter to the anti-slavery report. It's all published in the, in the wider uh, Western world, uh, recipients of this anti-slavery report at the organ of the uh, anti-slavery society. And they sent different missions to Ethiopia that continues until the time of Haile Selassie. Um, and again, de Consor, for example, who was a, a visitor to the court of Atsioanis has this, I find very telling uh, quote here. He says, because the slaves are not like some of the Negro races, creatures of low type of humanity without religion and capable of little improvement, but Christians, who, through, though rude and primitive in their faith and custom, are yet naturally endowed with moral and physical uh, qualities capable of higher development. It is this whole narrative that is captured in this quote, I find, that has this, there is Christian Ethiopia high culture and the rest is Africa, low culture. And it, it is not really about slavery, it is really about how can we protect this or how can we you know, help protect the Christian kingdom from falling prey to uh, Muslim uh, slavery. Again, you know, it's, just, it's a recurring theme, but in this particular quote, I find it uh, very fascinating that he makes this very strong uh, division between the Ethiopian high culture that we are as humanists and philanthropists are interested in, that is the Africa we want, <laughs> and the rest that is not so important because I in uh, the low type of humanity that we also find in Ethiopia, I mean, in the thinking of this uh, of the time, and of course the question always remains: What then is Ethiopia? You know, what Ethiopia are we actually talking about when we uh, when we dissect these kinds of uh, reports? Everybody knows uh, in our audience today, I'm sure, the, the, the problem that Haile Selassie was facing uh, with the Italian, the second Italian invasion and how much Italy tried to focus on slavery as a pretext for their um, humanitarian mission or their civilizing mission. Uh, as any other colonial power, slavery became a very um, suitable foreground on which to place, on which to sort of narrate to the own public the need to colonize uh, Africa. African territories. Uh, here's just a, a, a German translation, das letzte Bullwerk der Sklaverei, the last bulwark of slavery, uh, translated is one of the biggest, the most, most widely translated and widely read uh, pamphlets of um, the horrors or on the horrors of Ethiopian slavery um, that kind of make a strong point uh, as to why uh, Ethiopia has to be colonized again. And in this context, the civilizing mission and Ethiopia as a civilized country, where Haile Selassie since the 20s uh, tried to get Ethiopia on board with the League of Nations, this fight between being 
a slaving society and being a non-slaving society becomes enormously important and sort of is almost a, a deciding factor over life and death for Ethiopia. So in the 1920s, 30s, um, that is where most of the literature sort of centers and that is really where much of the sources are. We also have Haile Selassie opening uh, an anti-slavery bureau under the auspices of a Swiss diplomat, uh, Swiss British, actually a British diplomat, but to a Swiss uh, national. Um, and he has enormous material gathered that is now gathered in the Bodleian Library, for example. Uh, Susan Myers has worked with it, but I mean, this is a story that is not totally unknown. That is uh, really where slavery suddenly comes you know, to the foreground in Ethiopian foreign politics. Um, and it's interesting to see that Britain, or at least the foreign, uh, the, 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 the anti-slavery society falls from, wow, we would do anything to help Ethiopia eradicate slavery to, man, in the 30s, they still haven't eradicated it. Wow, they're really not uh, after that. And that's where it kind of withers away at this point. Um, missionary sources are sometimes very, very helpful, but of course we have to read them with the uh, necessary uh, caution. This is an excerpt from a very fascinating book that recently came out uh, by Sandra Rowald Schell um, on slaves that were captured on boats in the, uh, on their journey across the uh, Red Sea by the British who patrolled the Red Sea at that point, also partly given uh, uh, sort of uh, the, a go by the Ethiopian emperors because all these uh, anti-slavery treaties that were signed with the British always also had a point that they can patrol the Red Sea and see that uh, slavery is really being abolished so they can check on, on boats and dows and so forth. And these slaves, these Oromo slaves, they uh, end up in Lonsdale in a, in a mission society in South Africa. It's a very fascinating book about the odyssey of individuals and all these individuals, uh, if I remember correctly, 85 individuals are being, um, have, their, have their sort of re report cards in that book or this book builds on these 85 report cards that are mini interviews as one we can see here uh, of mostly children that have been captured and then freed and then interviewed at the missionary station. So this gives us a very interesting sort of um, background and a view from the slaves. Particularly interesting because usually as sort of the subtext of my previous uh, comments was, Slavery is mostly narrated through either the colonial power or the, the majority culture or the, the lords and not so much the serfs. Um, few and increasingly more uh, do we know about the Ethiopic uh, documentation. Ethiopic here I mean uh, mostly Giz, uh, Amharic, Tigrinya, so the written uh, Ethiosemitic languages. We see here, for example, a letter of Menelik that was sent to a regional ruler in Western Ethiopia where he congratulates him for his uh, constant support, uh, supply of slaves and uh, asks him to next time send more women than uh, men or boys rather. So we see some forms of, you know, how the center sort of radiated outside and slaves were demanded uh, to become part of the sort of uh, labor force uh, in the center. We also see here um, a picture that was taken by a Swiss visitor to Ethiopia in the 1930s around the, um, shortly before the Italian intervention. And that is a school for freed slaves done not by a foreign uh, power, but actually organized by uh, the so-called modernizers, the, the, the pioneers of change, uh, change the Japanizers, a clique around Haile Selassie that was crucially uh, interested in sort of remodeling the empire. And one of their proponents, uh, Hakim Warkene, uh, an advisor to Haile Selassie, opened this first uh, school for 
uh, freed slaves and the photo he has taken by a Swiss traveler called Rikli and now I have forgotten his uh, first name, Rikli, second name. So in all this, I think what we really have to focus on at the moment is um, dig out more Ethiopian sources, really start working on exploring mm -hmm. and trying to figure out why Ethiopian scholarship has been relatively silent on this issue. I don't know, if you, uh, the, the history of slavery is largely unexplored. I think we would, that wouldn't be an underestimate, uh, understatement. But then again, there is a little bit more foreign or Western scholarship, and then relatively little Ethiopian. Like we can count them on one hand, maybe five people who have really sort of engaged with slavery studies over the years. And Ethiopians in Ethiopian studies, that is rich. That's a, that's a long history and a long history of scholarship. So it is really peculiar why slavery has never really got, gotten the, the attention it uh, may deserve given its relative salience throughout the, the decades and centuries. So with these documents, we really need to go into the field and kind of counter check in oral narratives. This is something that is beginning. There's a small group of young scholars now that is actually doing more oral based uh, ethno-historical research. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to work with uh, most of them at the moment through this uh, project that, uh, that we have been doing and especially the Institute of Ethiopian Studies has been hugely helpful in facilitating research in this specific, uh, specific um, history. And then I think we kind of have to uh, put slavery into broader context, abolitionism, what happened after abolitionism? How do we configure the idea of, that is almost Western? Slavery was abolished and then it ended. That's the same story that we have in the US, roughly. <laughs> I'm, I'm simplifying now. It, is, it resembles the story of Ethiopia. Haile Selassie in 42, after he came back from exile and the uh, Italian invasion was over, uh, had his final decree and that ended slavery. But really what, what ended slavery and what ended? You know, there's really no <laughs> coherent or consistent understanding on what exactly slavery was. So this is still something that we have to work on. Um, what happened to, what are the biographies of slaves after 42, after, uh, until when? Because slaves, many slaves, as we know from local history that we are now starting to gather, lived on with families and also their, their children lived on with the, with the families. And so they kind of integrated in these families. So it didn't really go away. It just went silent, you know? Like a few years ago, the British were extremely vocal about it. Then something happens and then nobody talks about it anymore. This is kind of the situation that we are, that we are finding ourselves into. And this is something that we try to sort of uh, now kind of decipher, you know, the silence. Where, where does the silence come from? The silence also uh, applies to abolitionist movements. Um, there's really, compared to West Africa, for example, there are no active uh, NGOs or so that deal with slavery. slavery. Slavery has always been dealt with by the state. Haile Selassie, later on the Dirk, the socialist uh, uh, government, made a clear cut with the feudal predecessors and said, okay, we, we are changing the land uh, situation. Everybody gets access to land. There is no serfdom anymore. There is no slavery anymore. Everybody gets a piece of land, move on. And then comes the EPRDF who continue this path of move on. While still there are these categories of, uh, you know, uh, slave descendant and so forth. It's actually now under, under Abiy Ahmed, who had an initiative to put slavery on the map and create, or no, in the newly created Peace and Reconciliation Commission that has other things to do that are probably more important at the moment, there was a stream that wanted to look into the history of slavery. And there was an attempt to address slavery as a national legacy. Um, to my knowledge, I gave a presentation at that, uh, Reconciliation Commission to that, uh, to my current knowledge, this has withered away because of other more press, pressing issues, but at least so it, it's, it's in the people, it's in the minds of the, of the people that currently uh, run, run the government. But what I actually wanted to say, the narratives or the, the, the legacies, the trans, uh, 
generational marginalization of slaves exists. So I was talking at that uh, same con uh, presentation at the uh, Peace and Reconciliation Commission, I was talking to a politician and said, I'm very interested in your presentation. That's why I came because I just come back from a mediation. He's a, he's a politician in Southern Ethiopia, a mediation process where um, families of slave descendants married into uh, married a, a girl or a woman from non from free man descendants, and that went so bad that the girl was recaptured, and one counter attack uh, followed one counter attack, and he was in a mediation process, basically trying to uh, mediate the conflict that has uh, lost. Uh, that has cost uh, lots of uh, property because houses were burned, people were beaten up and so forth. Um, on a larger national scale, the history of slavery is hugely important for people of non-Semitic, non, I don't know, now it becomes a bit, I'm talking about colorism now, I'm talking about lighter skinned people as opposed to darker skinned people who for example, in Addis Ababa, if I walk with a friend from Gambela, Southwest Ethiopia, which is basically known as one of the slave reservoirs, it is very clear, often the case that this person will be addressed as Baria or Baricho. Baricho is a bit of the, the nicer, but still very paternalistic form of it. And, you know, it's like it, it lives on. There are a couple of new studies. Tom Boylston, for example, addresses this uh, in his historiography of uh, Sege on the uh, Christian community and the former slaves who live still there, like Gumu's descendants. Um, Baricho is, uh, it's a topic by itself. I'm just saying there's really a lot going on in the current you know, Ethiopian social fabric that would allow us to interrogate in those you know, dynamics and social, uh, social history of, uh, as I said here, the social history, the social relations, ethnicity, how much does ethnicity identity have to do with uh, these histories? How much does the history of slavery inform current processes of understanding Ethiopia as a nation state? You know, um, It's built on this idea of uh, ethnic federalism, that's fine, but it really caters to majority groups. So within all these majority groups, like for example, the Wulaita, you have several layers of uh, minority groups where only now the, the majority group is given political recognition. The lower groups, it's rather more re-emphasizing uh, and several studies uh, have shown that re-emphasizing this old uh, traditional, it's like a re-emerging re social stratification whereby the majority group is now in power and re reopens this you know, processes of former uh, stratifications. Of course, it would be great to place slavery in, in larger uh, social contexts, you know, also labor history. What does, what does the history of slavery, but also what does the present tell us about the history itself? How does uh, child labor, uh, low wage labor, uh, domestic labor and so forth across the country, not just in Addis Ababa or in the industry parks that are currently opening up anywhere, everywhere. Uh, how does this resemble an idea of work, uh, you know, an, an idea of uh, uh, coerced labor to a certain degree, you know? You, if we look into the slave, uh, into the history of slavery, we kind of might find that people were always owing labor to the state. So under such understandings, it may be very different to uh, findings of the World Bank or other institutions at the moment in configuring what happens in these industry parks. And I'm not saying that that's great. You know, I'm, I don't want to justify low wage uh, labor, for example, but I want to address labor in its sort of holistic context. And I think that would help us to understand better, you know, present and, and past uh, contexts of this kind of uh, coerced labor, bond labor, slave labor, and so forth. It would help us to interrogate better migration, where Ethiopia is now huge. It's a hub for migration to the Middle East. 
we cannot call this slavery really. It's often subsumed under, under modern slavery, but it's people go by their free will. This is not being dragged out of your family and then taken to a, uh, a harem in, in uh, the Ottoman wherever. But nonetheless, sort of bringing past and present into a clearer conversation and digging out more histories and at the same time having a clearer picture on what is uh, going on in Ethiopia at the moment would help us uh, to kind of unlock some of that his, uh, historical secrets that we are dealing with at the moment. And I think I leave it here because uh, probably I've already talked a lot, <laughs> 45 minutes if I'm not mistaken, and um, I'm happy to answer any question and I'm sure I was not coherent at any every point. It's uh, 12.46 now here in Ethiopia. So you are, I, I apologize, but I'm happy to address anyone and everything. No, no worries at all. Not at all, not at all. Thank you so much. That was a really fascinating presentation and covered so many interesting different topics. And it's just a shame that we only have this hour to be able to unpack things a little bit. Because, yeah, I think there's so many fascinating threads that we could certainly pick up on there. Um, so I think I'll start with some of the questions. And one thing that really interested me is the fact that there seems to be a lack of Ethiopian sources, certainly compared to Western accounts. And so the first thing I'd like to ask you is, why do you think there is this relative silence from Ethiopian sources? That, that is a fascinating question, and that is really some one of the one of the main questions that interests me at the moment. I would rephrase it: Why haven't Ethiopians picked the Ethiopian sources? Because it's not that they're not there; it's just that they haven't been really been fed into this uh, narrative. And I can't really I can't really uh, give you an answer to that. But we have just recently found a few um, uh, receipts issued by the Ministry of Finance uh, of the Imperial government under Haile Selassie in about 1920s, between the 1920s and 1930s actually, um, where you can, you can very clearly see that there's, an, there's a huge dissonance between the kind of narrative of the state, we abolish slavery. And at the same time, there's still this, uh, backlashes from, from the past where slavery was an important economic aspect. So, and because scholarship, I don't know, I mean, be, let's, not, let's not say scholarship, but slavery is a taboo topic in many societies. You do not really want to engage with that. Like, you know, yes, we are, we, we are a slaveholding society or we were a slaveholding society or whatever. Um, so I do think that this dissonance between it's an economic process, it is about labor, it is about you know uh, taxation, which this tax receipts clearly show, and compared to uh, a narrative and a European driven narrative that says, oh, now we have to abolish slavery because otherwise we are an uncivilized nation at this point in the 1920s, I think, makes it almost impossible for an Ethiopian scholar, but I don't want to judge. This is not about judgment. This is just an, a very clumsy attempt to uh, sort of navigate this field. Um, and then say, okay, then let's focus on the labor relations, the Gabar system, the serfdom and so forth that we know where we have lots of studies. It's not that Ethiopians have shied away from uh, this kind of you know, subaltern studies or labor relations and so forth, but talking about slavery per se has been problematic. And I think it's this dissonance between it is there, we want to modernize it, but we are not really able to do it like, you know, all together at once. Mm that has not been explored. And I think this is the Darth that we have in scholarship, actually. Yeah, so I think that's certainly fascinating. I think it's, I think certainly the issue is sort of any society that I can imagine there's this kind of disconnect between the sort of willingness to modernize and this sort of, the fact that it's quite a difficult topic to kind of um, candidly talk about, as it were. And I suppose another thing that sort of really interested me was the fact that Obviously, it's also very closely tied up to this question of kind of the minority group versus sort of the majority group versus all of these different minority areas. And hopefully 
those will get a bit more attention as scholarship in this field develops. Um, but I suppose my second question would be, given the relative lack of attention in these fields, um, what kind of ways can we go about exploring these local areas that haven't really been brought to light yet? And what sort of challenges um, are there in doing so? Mm. Well, I think it's really, so what we are trying now is to sort of synthesize the different narrative stories and data that we have, but a clear, um, way ahead would be to fascinate more and more Ethiopian uh, scholars and students of history um, to kind of explore all the, the little details, so to speak, the oral histories, the local histories, uh, the local connecting points. Um, now, Ethiopia and history, that may also be interesting in this uh, forum, there, there is, because of this overpowering idea of the empire state that made history, since the 90s and the introduction of ethnic federalism, there has often been a reluctance in kind of doing um, history at all in, univer in local universities. Because some universities just basically said, and some historians said, if we have to do state history with no place for our local history and what what we suffered in this state making process that some likened to internal colonialism itself um, what use does history have i would want that we move beyond this paradigm this dichotomy and kind of really engage with local histories. And there is a new attempt to have a, a, a freshman, a first year uh, general history curriculum that hasn't been in place for, I think, 25 years or so. So no uh, student of the humanities had the opportunity to go to a general class in history. This has been reopened and it had the course has one module on history. And I think this is a good starting point because if this actually comes into, uh, gets into place and, you know, universities take up this course that has now been uh, designed for freshmen, for first year students to give a broad overview of Ethiopian history, they encounter this history of, of slavery. And we have to, you know, get people from there. And it's really, it is fascinating because on every conference that we did so far in any workshop, the audience, not only the people who study slavery, but the audience, everybody has a story. Yes, my grandmother still had uh, the slave and he was carrying her uh, umbrella when she went to the market. And that's, you know, not even 60, 70 years ago. It is everywhere. It is really embedded in the society often in very, in very cordial relationships. I just come from an interview where somebody told me my, my foster mother was the slave of my father and she was closer to me than my mother. And I, I gave her alms uh, every Ramadan uh, till her death and she died 20 years ago. So it, it, it is their intimate relationship. It is not at all. And this is something that we have to make very clear that we're not interested in sort of uh, overpowering Ethiopian history with uh, European concepts of freedom and unfreedom and so forth. The opposite, we have to understand what freedom and unfreedom, dignity, work and so forth, and slavery eventually and bondship means from an Ethiopian perspective. That is our current issue, I would think. And if I may ask, in, in the point Please. of view and taking, taking in account that obviously, um, no matter what, we are still living in a world that it's more this guide, but there is still some stuff like that going on. But um, in terms of Ethiopia, there is some people from what I read that they think that slavery start to end in a sense because it ceased to be profitable. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, but what I've checked, for example, Somalia, they've ends again, slavery in 1910, Sudan in 1924, Kenya in 1907, uh, however, Ethiopia on, only in 1942. There is any relation between uh, why it will lead to the end in, in such a late period, and at the same time, 
can we say that it's because of um, a money position in terms of economy, in terms of it was or, or it's, it starts to decline in terms of prof profitability? Mm -hmm. Very, very, very interesting and very important question. Thank you. And actually good for me also to uh, rethink some of the, the thoughts that I'm having. So I, I do believe that slavery in the colonial context wasn't as immediate and political issue. You know, you, at some point you just made an, an agreement and said, look guys, slavery is over. Oman in Kenya, you know, had an anti-slavery and abolitionist uh, uh, in the, in, the, in the East African protectorate, uh, Somalia, under the British authority. I think this were just, their landmarks, yes. I don't think this decrease meant much in the local context. Well, let us work on that because the East African landscape in slavery studies is anyways relatively underexplored as com uh, compared to the, to the West African uh, context. In Ethiopia, I think the difference is really because the emphasis was so strong. It was a non-colonized state. It was not that the force from outside came and said, now we have a decree, now you know, we, we modernize the, the bureaucracy. And part of that is, of course, that we subscribe to the end of slavery. It was an indigenous sort of process of state making. It was hugely contested. It was much broader in the society. It, it was really a, a painful process for Haile Selassie in trying to organize the modernization, taxation, you, you spoke about that in the beginning, slavery has a huge impact. I mean, you, you need to, if there were this uh, te taxes in slaves, there, there was really a, a modernization of the, of the taxation process. Uh, De Halpert, this Swiss-British uh, diplomat who was uh, organizing the anti-slavery society, has, a, has a, wrote a, a relatively large report on the modernization of the, of the taxation process. So all I want to say is in Ethiopia, it was a, a real um, ongoing process of rethinking labor relations and modernization and probably even people-to-people -people relations. We have this Coleman paper, gradual abolition uh, in uh, immediate or gradual abolition. I'm just now not getting the title right, but it's uh, uh, where it is very clear that Haile Selassie fought to fr uh, a front of uh, conservative uh, landholders who wanted these systems to continue together with his modernizers and his Japanizers who wanted to reform the country and really bring it uh, in what they may have thought to be up to par with European powers. But my argument would be that European powers didn't even give that attention that they, or to slavery that they gave it on paper. Yeah, it was like, we have to abolish slavery. Eventually it didn't matter. Slavery is not, for, for, for the colonial expansion, it was not an, it was a great pretext, but it was not important to abolish slavery as such. That's one argument still to be explored, but you know. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we're going to um, wrap this up here just because of the time difference. We don't take up, we don't take up too much of um, Dr. Knuckleberg's time, but um, I'd just like to say thank you ever so much for coming to talk to us today. Uh, thank you to Joao and Pedro, and thank you to everybody for watching as well. It was great. Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone, as well. Uh, and sorry again for the difference of time that we have, the time zones that we didn't think is clear of uh, midnight in the room sleep. But <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's perfect. It was really an honor to be with you and uh, speak to you. And uh, good luck for your program, and I hope this was... Uh, interesting for your viewers yeah. and your program yeah. and, uh, in fact, i can just to wrap it up to read the message that we receive from uh, an africanist that she said she is watching from new hampshire it's uh, louisa piet so we had some people who are very interested on, on, on the subject definitely fantastic thank you so much once again and thank you everyone thank you very thank much we'll see you in thank the you very next much. episode of confabulating thank you very All much the best bye-bye Take care. Thank you.